Um, welcome back to the second week of Beaverwork Summer Institute. Um, and uh, our guest lecture today is Professor Amos Winter from the MIT Mechanical Engineering Department. He's a professor with a focus on machine and product design for um, emerging markets. So we heard a lot from faculty, we heard some from some industry innovators, and now we have um, a, facu a faculty member who is truly an innovator. Um, he comes to MIT after getting a bachelor's degree from Tufts and a PhD and MIT from a PhD and master's degree from MIT. Um, he also, as you'll see, our speakers are incredibly distinguished. He has a Tufts University Young Alumni Distinguished Achievement Award. He received the Edgerton Award at MIT for faculty achievement, and he is a tech, MIT Tech Review 35 under 35 innovator. Um, so. He's going to talk to you today. His talk is called Leveraging Technical and Socioeconomic Insights to Create Products for Developing in Global Markets. Um, and I, again, encourage you to put your questions in the chat. Um, and at the end of the talk, we'll, we'll ask some questions along the way if, if needed. But at the end of the talk, we would really like this to be very interactive. So um, be prepared if you, uh, if, to be ready to ask him a question yourself, and we'll unmute you. So um, with that, um, Professor Winter, welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're very excited to hear your talk. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. And uh, I give big props to all the students taking time in the summer to uh, geek out a little bit and you know, further your passions on technology and science and, and good things like that. Um, I, I did a program like that uh, between my junior and senior year, and it was, it was very transformative to me. And, and I think still stands for me the most intellectually liberating experience that, I, that I've had in my life. So way to go. Um, yeah, so as Jennifer said, today I'm going to talk to you about some of the stuff my research group does. Uh, our group is called the Global Engineering and Research Lab, or GEAR Lab. And the, the main lesson that I want you to take away from this talk is that um, we, so we focus on designing products and technologies for developing and emerging markets. And the, the key, I'd say, recipe for, for doing that, hopefully successfully, is bringing together technical and socioeconomic insights and really operating at that interface to create new innovations that are high performance, low cost, and can meet the needs of the market. And if you're successful doing that, you can not only create products that work well in, in resource constrained countries, you can bring high value solutions back to wealthy markets like in the US and Europe. And I chose this as an intro slide because I think it really captures this happening, this, this ethos happening in practice. This is taken at one of our recent field pilots in, in India. And uh, you have MIT folks, you know, over here and me up here, and then our team from uh, Tata Projects, that, that's a big industrial uh, partner that does water purification. And we work together to make what we think is going to be a quite disruptive, uh, game-changing uh, water purification system. So to start out, though, I, I want to uh, ask a question or, or broach a question of, you know, why focus specifically on product design for developing and emerging markets and why is that challenging? Well, if you look at indicators of human health and well-being, uh, and, and you can take, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are put out by the Uni United Nations, I think you can find some interesting things when you look at them through an engineering lens. So, you know, some of these factors deal with uh, uh, improving water and sanitation and energy and, and like maternal and, and young people's health. And what's interesting about these challenges that still affect billions of people in the developing world, there's still, you know, just to give you context, there's about 2 billion people who don't have access to clean water, another 2 billion that don't have access to a toilet. The infant mortality rate is, you know, more than 10 times higher in many countries than it is in the U.S. What's interesting when you think about these challenges from that engineering perspective, we have solutions to these problems in wealthy countries. Um, we do have clean water, we do have functional toilets, but for some reason, those solutions have not mapped over to poor countries. And the reason is, I think, because of a price performance disparity. So if you look at any sort of class of technologies, any sort of family, 
they're going to lie on some sort of nonlinear price performance curve. So let's take automobiles, for example. You can, you can maybe buy a Ferrari for a huge amount of money, but it gives you know, a relatively marginal increase in performance over like a Toyota Corolla, which is you know, orders of magnitude less, but maybe only goes half as fast. And the reason this creates an issue in developing and emerging markets is that people in poor countries still demand a reasonable level of performance. Like nobody wants a semi-functional toilet or semi-clean water. But the issue is that they may only be able to afford a price that is much lower than what we pay for that performance in a wealthy country. And because of this disparity, there's no way that we can just adapt existing solutions to meet that price and performance point demanded by developing and emerging markets. And so this is the situation that my research group typically finds ourselves in, that we realize that there is this disparity and somehow we have to get around it. We can't adapt our way to a solution. We have to disrupt. And so we look at problem solving in three main phases. The first is we try to characterize what the market is telling us as far as requirements of users and constraints and look at that both from a socioeconomic and technical perspective to see you know, what are the variables that we could manipulate to our advantage to hit this new price performance point. Then the second thing we do is we try to leverage what, what a place like MIT is best at, is really using hardcore engineering science and good product design principles to generate disruptive insights of how we can make this leap to a new price performance point. And then what we do is we don't just think about a single market solution. We try to say, boy, if we could create a high performance, low cost solution, maybe we could grow that into a whole new family of technologies and actually bring it back to wealthier markets through a process that's called reverse innovation. So we have our, our low cost, high performance solution down here, and then a really high value variant up here in wealthy markets and then we can really create a global impact. So I, I cut my teeth doing this and really experiencing this firsthand through the design and innovation of this product, which is called the Leverage Freedom Chair. And it was a developing world wheelchair that was designed for context like you see in this video. This was taken in rural India. And what we realized is that users of wheelchairs in, in wealthy countries in the US and Europe also want this high performance, low cost, go anywhere, easy to repair type wheelchair. And that enabled us to create what's called the Grit Freedom Chair. And we started a company around this called Global Research Innovation Technology, or GRIT. It goes by the acronym GRIT. And so that has now turned into a profitable company that's selling about 400 chairs a year. We've done, we sold at least one chair in every state in the country. Um, and so we've seen that value that was derived from a developing world need really manifest into a valuable product in, in wealthy countries as well. So, in today's talk, I'm gonna go through three of the projects in my research group that I think highlight these three stages of innovation as we're trying to engage global markets. The first is gonna be focused on water purification and how we use a type of desalination technique called electrodialysis to make a very effective solution for off-grid desalination. This picture you're looking at is a solar-powered desalination system that we designed. The second is, uh, is going to be telling you about how we leverage uh, rigorous engineering science to create high performance, low cost, passive prosthetic feet that actually meet or exceed the performance of, of conventional like Western prostheses that cost upwards of 100 times more. And then the third is talking about drip irrigation, uh, which is a method of irrigating crops, just dripping out the exact water, amount of water you need and the innovation that we created to cut the pumping power and pumping energy substantially to, to utilize that technology, which is opening it up to uh, usage in, in rural areas and off-grid areas. So to start out with desalination, one of the first and I think most important points of this talk that I wanna to convey to you is that when we started thinking about water purification, we took a big step back and looked at a totally blank screen and didn't, tried really hard not to apply any assumptions or artificial constraints. So, you know, at a, at a, at a place like MIT, there's, there's lots and lots of creative people thinking up new solutions all the time. But what can happen too easily is you create a hammer and then try to go look for a nail. And we wanted to do the opposite. We wanted to take the time to do the detective work to understand what is the nail 
that we're trying to pound and what would be the most appropriate hammer that we could design for it. So we started with a target market of India. And the first thing we had to investigate was, well, what makes water dirty in India? And by far the most prevalent contaminant in the country is salt. And this is a map of the country showing the milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids in the water. And most of those are salts. And what we found was 60% of the land area of the country has water in the ground that is too salty to safely drink. That's above WHO standards of about 500 milligrams per liter. Now, as we dug into this more, we realized that communities that face uh, drinking salty water, so about 70% of the country uh, uses groundwater for drinking water, and also about 70% of the country does not have reliable grid access to the electrical grid. And that becomes a problem when you want to desalinate water because it begs the question, where do you get the energy to do it? And so doing this detective work, we realized that, boy, in the areas where we have the saltiest water, we actually have the most solar energy available. And so this plot on the right is showing uh, solar radiance uh, throughout the country. So there's this natural synergy between how much salt's in the water and how much energy you have to use to take out of it, and then how much energy is available with solar power. And so that made us realize, boy, solar powered solutions could work really well here. But we also had to learn a cautionary tale from one of our corporate partners, Tata Projects, that when they took the current industry leading technology of reverse osmosis, and I suspect many of you have heard of that technology of removing salt from water, when they have taken that off grid, it became exorbitantly expensive and actually doubled the capital cost of their desalination systems because of the cost of the solar power system because of the energy you need to take the salt out of the water. So we looked at this socioeconomic landscape and then dug into the technical, technical factors of what different technologies we could consider. And we had a big insight that electrodialysis, which is an old technology, it's been around for more than 50 years, it's used in processes like concentrating juice, and it's an electrochemical process that electrically pulls salt out of water. We realized that for the salinity ranges we would find in India, which would usually be about 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million, um, that the, the energy required to take that salt out with electrodialysis is about half of what it would be for reverse osmosis. Why that was such an important insight was because if we want to go off grid, then we need half the power system compared to reverse osmosis to use electrodialysis. So we cut that power system cost. Also the big uh, uh, insight that we had was that uh, reverse osmosis typically wastes about 60% of the water that comes into the systems. So you're not judiciously using this, this somewhat constrained water resource of brackish groundwater. And instead we can lower that wastage substantially with electrodialysis. So the moral of the story is that we took the time to do this detective case to rigorously justify why electrodialysis could be a game changer in India. And it was because of that, that we were able to raise a lot of money to, to advance this project. And we really were confident that we were chasing after a solution that could make a big impact uh, by using solar powered or photovoltaic powered electrodialysis desalination. So abbreviated PVED here in the title. Now, this was just a paper study. We in our group have to complement that with a lot of hands-on work. So we make full-scale systems. And so this is a picture of our first full-scale pilot system that we made. And this would be big enough for uh, a community of about 3,000 people. It could make enough drinking water for them. And uh, serendipitously, in 2015, we entered uh, a prize program put on by USAID, which is our government's agency for international development. And we, we tested it and we ended up winning this, this competition. Uh, and that was a great foot in the door to start expanding this technology with USAID, but it also showed us a lot of drawbacks of real world operations. And that's another point that I wanna get across in this, this presentation that we do field pilots constantly to understand not only from a technical standpoint, is our technology working well? But also from a practical standpoint, is it meeting the requirements driven by variables that we, we may not even be able to cap capture with equations, that we may only find out from the field? And so one example has been taste. 
is that we initially designed our systems to be at a salinity of 300 parts per million uh, or, or 300 milligrams per liter. It's about the same uh, factor. Um, and for India, that was actually too salty. Even though that was safe per WHO standards, people have become accustomed to drinking lower salinity water and have developed a palate for it. But another big insight that we had was around cost that we understood from doing these pilot systems. So this first field pilot we made, it cost about $63,000 to make that system. And most of that capital cost uh, was in the electrodialysis stack, nearly $40,000. Now to put that in contrast, we had to somehow compete with reverse osmosis systems that cost only about $5,700. So somehow we had to reduce the cost of this thing by an order of magnitude in order to get it affordable for what we had already seen was affordable for communities through uh, Tata Project's existing business selling on-grid reverse osmosis systems. And they've done about 3,000 of these systems throughout India. So we're very confident in the price points and the usage practices of those users if they got a system that was affordable. So these socioeconomic and technical insights led to a whole series of innovations that really boiled down to this, this plot right here. So in the picture above, this is showing our most recent field pilot prototype. And what is so unique about this system is that it actually can track the rise and fall of the sun throughout the day. And these purple uh, data are showing how the system is operating through the day. In each sawtooth here is showing a batch of water that's processed. And our big insight was realizing that we could adjust the power consumption of the system to rise and fall with the sun. So this system actually changes how fast it pumps water and how fast it takes the salt out of the water in order to fully fill out this bell curve of solar power, of uh, solar power available. So we always are using all the energy we have available and we could do so by minimi and minimize the batteries we need. Now that's in contrast to a conventional static power electrodialysis system, which is running in this blue sawtooth, where in the middle of the day, you're just running at a basically constant power level. You capture energy and batteries in the middle of the day and then use it at the end of the day. Now this innovation has boiled down to a substantial cost advantage. So this plot on the right is showing how on-grid reverse osmosis breaks down as far as cost of the water in terms of dollars per cubic meter of water you make. And you can see here that there's a really low capital cost, but a relatively high operational cost because you have to buy that energy versus a solar powered system where you just buy the solar panels up front and then you basically don't pay for energy after that. Now, this next bar is showing static ED, how over a 10 year lifetime that breaks down to the, the overall water cost and then how our innovations have manifested in a dramatic reduction in water costs. So although our capital cost is higher than on-grid reverse osmosis, our operational costs are much lower, and we can actually be competitive with reverse osmosis, even with the capital cost of buying the power system and the relatively larger capital cost of electrodialysis. So again, the moral here is that we had to understand market drivers, like the cost that would be acceptable, because this water is purchased by people. And we had to apply a ton of technology and innovation in, in MIT caliber research in order to get to this point. So we now are, uh, are doing the last field piling of this and we just got a big chunk of money to actually bring this to commercialization. And it looks like we will make a company based on this to actually bring it to market. All right, well the second project I wanna talk about is high performance, low cost prosthetic feet. And again, the background of this is market driven that we, we teamed up with the biggest distributor of prosthetic feet in the world called Jaipur Foot. And they said to us, look, we have this foot that we give out 28,000 of per year. It's worked pretty well for the last 50 years, but it's still handmade, it's pretty heavy, and it's not compliant with, with uh, international accepted standards for prostheses. But what's good about it is it's, it's somewhat flexible and it looks pretty lifelike, so people are less likely to be stigmatized. Uh, when they go barefoot in, in developing countries. And that's important because people with disabilities still often face a lot of stigmas and that prevents them from like getting a job or getting married or, or fully integrating into society. Now, in addition to that, we realized that because people want to look like they can walk with able-bodied gait, how a person walks is really important. So if a guy is walking with a pronounced limp like this, 
they're more likely to be stigmatized. So people want to walk as close to able-bodied as possible. So this created this really interesting research challenge of how do we create this high-performance, low-cost, passive, mass-manufacturable prosthetic foot? And what came out of that as a research question is how can we quantitatively predict the mechanical design of a prosthetic foot and, and how, how that design is required to induce a desired biomechanical performance, how a person walks with it. And as we dug into the research behind prosthetic foot design, we found that this question had never been answered of how to connect mechanical design to biomechanical performance, which was surprising to us because prosthetic feet have been around for you know, well over a thousand years, but this hadn't been answered. And so what we went back to is fundamental physics that you guys have already studied to figure this out. So if you think of a spring that has a force applied to it, you apply that force, the spring deflects, you get a certain amount of deflection shown as delta. And what connects the force and deflection is K, the spring constant. So you guys have probably heard F equals KX in physics, right? Well, that K is what relates that force and motion transfer. And that's what we're getting to in prosthetic foot design. We want to apply load and get a certain response. So the way we thought about a foot is really with a black box to say, okay, what's going to matter to the user is actually what happens with their shin or their shank. And if it can move through the correct motion in time, they're going to feel like they're walking normally. So what if we think about that movement we want? And what if we think about the forces we want to apply for the, to the foot called the kinetics, which is the ground reaction forces and where those forces are applied, which go from your heel to the toe throughout the step. Then what we can do is optimize what's going on in this black box to best connect this force and motion relationship, just like you would with a spring K if under a certain force you wanted a certain deflection. So our feet are effectively just springs. So what came out of that was the ability to model uh, prosthetic feet that are just passive plastic pieces of material that when you walk on them will deflect, and you can see the foot deflecting here, to enable the shin and thus the rest of the body to move very fluidly with able-bodied motion. So what that looks like with a person walking on it is here's, you know, to begin with an animation, and then as they go through the step, they'll strike with their heel, and it'll flex a little bit as they load it up, and that will induce a very fluid flow of motion. Now, I want to stop for a second here and point out a really important socioeconomic factor. This foot looks nothing like a foot, right? And that was something that was really important that we heard from users as we did testing. This is a guy in India who said, you know, or the users would typically say, wow, foot feels great, but it doesn't look like a foot. And I'd, I'd really stick out like a sore thumb if I wore this barefoot. And so we also had to think about how could we, um, whoops, how could we incorporate into this sorry, the video is hitching a little bit, a uh, cosmetic covering that still enables the foot to look really lifelike, but retains that, that mechanical performance that we need. And so a lot of our work has also been on that cosmetic covering to make the foot look lifelike and perform adequately. So here are some data of showing the foot performance. This was, this was taken recently with five different people testing the, the load-bearing internals of our foot. And what's cool about the theory that we've created is that it enables us to design a foot specifically for individuals. So you can see that the foot shape has changed pretty dramatically in these five people, and that is because their body weight is quite different. It goes from about 55 to 85 kilograms. And so with our design ability, we're able to customize these feet for an individual's body size, body weight, and walking habits. And this is opening up really, really cool new options in the 3D printed feet, which we're starting work on. And we're envisioning that within a day, a person can go into a clinic, and this would be like in a United States context, go into a clinic, get measured, have a foot printed, and walk out with it in the same day, rather than having to wait a few weeks to have a foot ordered. And as far as performance of the foot, our foot is shown in red in these curves. And what it's compared to is in the dashed lines, able body performance, and this is forces 
This is movement of where those forces are applied going from the heel to the toe. And this is motion of the knee up at the knee joint of how it's moving in X and Y space and how the angle of the shin is moving through time as you go through a step. And so what we're comparing our foot against is able-bodied values and dashed lines and then the patient's prescribed feet and then a leading carbon fiber foot. And what's exciting about these data is that we're very closely replicating able-bodied motions. And we're able to do that with any, any iteration in the design. We basically measured these people, made of a foot, slapped it on their leg, bam, they walked perfectly. And the other exciting thing is that our feet are made with about $5 worth of plastic versus these two commercial feet will cost over $1,000, you know, anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. So we're, we're going back to that, that objective I showed in the first plot where we're achieving very high performance, but at a drastically lower price point. And then going back to the socioeconomic drivers here, we, we have been working with Vibram. You guys probably recognize this logo from the bottom of your hiking boots. This is the world's leader in hiking boot design. We've worked with them to make a cosmetic covering of our foot that we can encapsulate our, our what's called the keel, the load bearing element of the foot inside. And then it still looks lifelike. And we can add features that give a user like traction in, in wet context. Uh, so we can provide better functionality than existing feet. And so we've conducted an eight month field pilot of these uh, and we're still following up with these users, but this fit has had no visible damage. It's lasted really well. Um, it, uh, it's enabled people to have more agility so they can complete an obstacle course in 8% less time. They walk 10% faster. And then as far as uh, ranking the foot on a one to five scale versus the, the industry standard Jaipur foot, our foot is also ranking higher. So the user satisfaction is higher. And so these are really compelling results. And we are also moving towards commercialization with this right now. We just got a chunk of money to do that. And we hope to commercialize this in the next year or two. Now to wrap up, I want to talk, briefly talk about uh, the last project on irrigation. Um, and so throughout the developing world, the common way to irrigate is with what's called flood irrigation, shown in this picture. And this is enabling farmers to irrigate is a tremendously powerful way to lift them out of poverty. So there's 2.5 billion smallholder farmers throughout the world. Uh, there, there's about half a billion farms and, and on average five people who live on them. And the most impactful development intervention you can do for them is enable them to irrigate. Because with irrigation, they can grow more and higher value crops from their land, make more money and get out of poverty. Now, the issue is in water stressed countries like India, already the replenishment rate of water is not meeting the consumption rate of water being drawn out of the ground. So water tables are going down and down and down very quickly. And already globally, 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture. So it's, you can't just say, okay, we wanna take a few hundred million farmers and have them start sucking water out of the ground because it could create horrible uh, ecological impacts. So a potential silver bullet to this problem is drip irrigation, which is a means of irrigating by just dripping out the exact amount of water crops need from these little drip emitters. You can grow 50% more crops than you could with rain irrigation. Uh, and you can reduce water consumption by 60% compared to these conventional flood irrigation methods. As far as the global market opportunity, this plot is showing how much relative area of the world is, is cropland, how much of that is irrigated, shown in the blue circle, and the, and the pun intended drop in the bucket that is drip irrigation with a little red dot right in the center. So there's a massive economic opportunity to grow the number of farms that could use drip irrigation. So what we have focused on is really the crux of the problem of what is inhibiting drip irrigation to get out to small scale, particularly off-grid farmers. So existing drip irrigation systems require about one bar of pressure or one atmosphere to operate correctly, to emit the right flow rate. And why that creates an issue is it requires a relatively high amount of pumping power. Your pumping power is your pressure multiplied by the flow rate. Crops need a certain flow rate, so it's really the pressure that you could potentially manipulate to lower pumping power. And so for an off-grid system, you need about $3,000 per acre. So what we are focusing on is if we can design drip emitters that operate at one-tenth the pressure, we can, by changing nothing else in the system, cut the capital cost about in half. And depending on subsidies where you live in the world, 
get the price down to a really affordable payback period. Uh, in India, it would be about a year and a half. And so what we're trying to do here, this is really a global problem because if we're successful in this, we can help farmers out in poor countries and enable them to farm better. But these solutions are just as relevant to, to large scale farms in places like California that, that also depend on drip irrigation. This would manifest in major energy savings on pumping costs for farmers like this. So what we're trying to do from a physics perspective is change the pressure versus flow rate behavior of these drippers. So we want drippers that, as you apply pressure to them, come up to a constant flow rate and then start emitting this constant flow rate even if you change pressure. And we want that to start at about 0.1 bar or 0.1 atmospheres. And in contrast, current drippers typically start that behavior at about one bar. So we're trying to roll this curve back. Now, when you open up one of these drippers, What's inside is a little silicone membrane that can deflect on these flow control features as you uh, apply pressure. And that is what creates this flow curve. And we can manipulate these, these features, which are the orifice, the lands where the, the membrane touches down and contacts again, against in a little channel through which water is directed through those lands. And so we can manipulate those to change that pressure flow rate uh, relationship. Now again, what was super interesting when we started this project is we look back at the history of the design of these devices and they actually go back to the late 1940s. And we realized that from then until now, nobody had mathematically described how to make these drippers behave in a certain way. It's, it's a very similar story as the prosthetic foot. The mathematical based relationships to di dictate what pressure versus flow relationships you get relative to the designs that just didn't exist. And so what we did was figure it out. We, you know, we went down to basics, we looked at this dripper, and this is a simple model looking at the membrane, the orifice, the lands, and the channel uh, from two orthogonal perspectives of cut views. And then we did all the solid mechanics and fluid mechanics to understand as we apply pressure, both how does water flow through this dripper, and then how does the deflection of that silicone membrane affect the flow resistance through all the channels in order to get that pressure flow rate relationship we want. And what came out of that study was the design of a dripper that does hit that activation pressure, its target flow rate, at about 0.15 bar versus commercial products that are about point, uh, are that activate at around one bar. And so this is a real picture of, of our drippers that we've made. We've done a pre-production run. And why this is so significant is that we can cut pumping energy by about 50% with no behavior change to the farmer and no cost increase because these drippers are made exactly the same way as existing drippers. And this is very exciting for particularly off-grid farmers because just this little dripper alone can cut the cost of an overall system by about 40%. And so we're putting our money where our mouth is by actually testing these in real context. We've done two years of field piloting thus far in nine locations throughout Jordan and Morocco uh, in real farming context of these drippers, where they're set to run at half the pumping power as conventional drippers. And over these pilots, we've, we've experimentally realized 43% uh, uh, average energy reduction. Uh, and actually in the year two, it's been closer to 50 or 60% as people got their usage practices correctly, didn't overpressurize uh, the drippers. This, this difference between 43% and 50% is, is through user error. It's, error. it's not the, actually the performance of the dripper. So this is very exciting. And when farmers have come and, and, and come to our field days to see these things in action, their response has been like, holy cow, we want to buy these because they immediately understand the economic advantage of cutting pumping power. And so if you're an on-grid farmer and you can cut your pumping power in half, that can almost double your profit margins. It's massive economically because pumping power is significant. So to wrap up, I just want to reflect back on this price performance curve and, and reiterate how powerful this view is of solving global challenges and making both emerging markets and global market products. Because you can look at this predictively. You can think about, boy, I need to jump off this curve. And if I hit that point, I can grow it into a global technology. And this is very much what we are actively doing. So in the Decel project, this was motivated by market needs elucidated by Tata projects. 
It was invested in by Tata and UNICEF and USAID. And now it's being invested in by uh, another global player, Eureka Forbes in small scale irrigation, our US Department of the Interior, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, which is helping us create US focused designs and the market leader in electrodialysis, Suez. So we are very much trying to make a global product line of this technology. Same story with prosthetic limbs. Jaipur Foot told us about this huge market need. Um, a, a group at, at MIT, the Tata Center and NSF, our National Science Foundation invested in it. And now we are funded by the US military to make ruggedized feet for soldiers who wanna go back to active duty or veterans who want an active lifestyle. Uh, we actually got some fun labs uh, last year to make uh, 3D printed variants. And then we've worked with Vibram and McLaren, actually the race car company, to really optimize both the internal structure and the external structure of the feet in order to grow a, product, a global product line. And then finally, same deal with the drip irrigation uh, project. Jane inspired the project, they and USAID invested in it, and now we've teamed up with one of the world uh, leaders in pumps, Xylem, and we're working BASF on improved membranes, and again, really trying to grow a global product line that can impact farmers everywhere. So with that, uh, that wraps up my presentation, and uh, I really look forward to hearing your questions over the next half hour. Thanks very much for coming. You Thank you. More info, by the way, on, on all this by uh, going to our website, gear.mit.edu, and also my email address is right here as well. This is fantastic. This is fascinating. And I haven't heard you talk before, so this is really um, very impressive work. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, call on the students if, that, if that's okay. So um, maybe we can start with Avik Banerjee. Would you like to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Abik. Uh, so regarding your like DSAL project, I saw this concept in like a journal article. Um, and so it was basically a low cost method of leveraging the latent heat from the solar panels to generate clean water. So yeah. I guess like how feasible do you think that technology is? That's an awesome question. And, and one we actually had to ask ourselves uh, way back at this point in doing the detective work. And so we had to look at energy energetically, um, how much energy does it take to uh, purify water through distillation, you know, using that latent heat to basically boil the water and condense it versus some of these other methods uh, like ele electrodialysis or reverse osmosis. And there's uh, about an order of magnitude increase in energy requirement when you use a distillation-based method. And why that turned into a barrier for us was actually land area. Um, we worked out how much area you would need for like solar collection uh, of, of just solar heat to do that distillation. And it was, you know, just from land cost and just tractability of trying to maintain a system of that size, it was much more expensive than using electrodialysis or reverse osmosis. And so it, it wasn't feasible to produce all your water, certainly. Now to your question, yeah, you could use some of that heat captured on, in like PV panels to maybe do some distillation. And then that has to beg the question, well, how much water could you generate? And that type of question is one so often not addressed in, in I would say science in general, but also developing world technologies. In that like there's actually a very popular technology out right now that can capture water from air. And it's just passive and you blow the water through the system and it'll extract water, but the volumes of water you can generate it from it versus the cost of generating that water don't come anywhere near close to holding up to reverse osmosis or electrodialysis. So the fact that you can make some water is different than making enough water or making cheap enough water. And that is something that I really want you to take home from this presentation is that it's too easy to fall into a tech focused trap, you know, where you're like, oh, I can make water from air, isn't that cool? You also have to ask yourself the socioeconomic questions is like, are people gonna afford it? And can I scale it up enough to make enough water for people's needs? Great That's question. Great. We Thank have you. another question along mm -hmm. the same lines of um, getting back to the desalination techniques. Um, Needy, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Yes, first I wanted to say thank you so much for all the information. It's really fascinating to see what technology can do. Um, my question was, is when we're talking about agriculture um, and how there's a lack 
of availability of fresh water? Are the desalination techniques that you're applying to providing fresh drinking water, do you think it's going to be feasible in the future to apply those to large scale agricultural techniques? I love your, your line of thinking. You're, you're right on the ball. Absolutely. Uh, which is something we're working on because what we found is that the, we have reduced the cost of desalinated water to the point where it can start making sense for agriculture. You know, one of the things you have to remember is that um, volumetrically agriculture uses so much more water than people use for drinking. And I mentioned in the presentation, 70% globally is used for agriculture. And, and how that manifests economically is that the, the, the price per volume of water can be much higher for potable water than it can be for agriculture. And this is why groups like Tata Projects have been able to form businesses where people come up with jerry cans, pay a bit of money, fill them up, and they buy that water for drinking. Now, because we've lowered the price enough, we've started to be able to ask ourselves, could it be viable for ag water? And then coupled with that, if we can use drip irrigation, so we cut our water consumption requirement in half compared to other methods, and we particularly use our drip irrigation systems, which cut our, cut our energy requirements uh, in half, all of those start adding up to a pretty compelling value proposition. So we have done some benchmarking comparisons of cost of irrigation water that we could produce relative to what has been commercially adopted in, in very water stressed places like uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia and some places, sometimes in Australia too. And we're seeing that we should be able to produce water that's, or we think could be about half to a quarter the price. And that's a projection. You know, I, I think in reality it might be more, but I think we can at least be competitive and maybe be cheaper. So that is pretty compelling for us in making us now uh, investigate designing these integrated systems. And that has created this really cool engineering science challenge because when we start putting our drip system and our desal system together, they each have all sorts of variables that we can manipulate to best match them for a salinity range, solar radiance, field size, water volume, crop type, et cetera. And that optimization of all those variables is actually a pretty tough intellectual challenge. In addition, to predicting weather and ensuring the system performs adequately with variations in the weather all year round. So we have incorporated now machine learning to do weather predictions and all in our newest desal systems can are constantly adjusting themselves in their power consumption with predictions using machine learning uh, to, to determine what do they think the weather's going to look like in the next hour, given past data and current data of weather. So yeah, it's super fun and I love that question and I love your design of thinking. Try to kill as many birds with one stone or two stones in this case as you can. That's great. So switching gears a little bit, there's a question um, related to the prosthetics. So Pranav Ghassani, would you like to unmute? Yeah, and ask hi. I, as you're talking about the prosthetic, I was actually wondering what's the estimated lifetime for the new prosthetics that you designed? And then Specifically, you said a type of plastic, and I wanted to know if that's biodegradable as well. Oh man, these are these are fantastic questions, um, and and you're really picking up on potential uh, uh, challenges that that we face in this work. Um, so the lifetime of a prosthetic foot is determined by ISO standards, um, and it's five or ten million cycles, and that corresponds to I want to say it's five years of use on average of a person, but it's, it's a few years. I can't remember exactly the, the, the correlation. Um, and so we're, we're trying to design our feet to meet those performance metrics in, in fatigue, in, in life cycle. Now, one of the problems a lot of groups have faced trying to make plastic feet is that they, they can't hold up to that life cycle compared to carbon fiber feet. And one of the things we realized uh, about a year ago is that this, this is an earlier in, uh, inside architecture of our foot that when we tested it per the ISO uh, standards, actually couldn't hold up to them. It would, it would last a few hundred thousand cycles and then break. But then when we tested it with the cosmetic covering, it actually could meet the ISO standards. It, it, we, we didn't f do the whole test just because of time constraints, but we went over a million cycles. And after that, you know, we assume stuff won't change, but we will do full tests 
in the future. What was so interesting about that is we realized that we could actually use the cosmetic covering structurally. So our newest feet actually use the cosmesis as a load bearing element to take some stress off the internal keel and improve the lifetime of the foot. Now, we have also, uh, I'm not showing it in this presentation because it's still proprietary. We haven't patented it yet. Um, we have some new designs of the foot that are intentionally designed to meet that full life cycle uh, per the ISO standards. And they should be able to. And that, that comes through uh, a, a combination of changed mechanical design and better characterization of the material. So since we designed this foot, we have better uh, material properties that we've worked with. So uh, yeah, the long answer to your short question, yes, we, we are trying to make it last many years of not only just walking, but walking in really harsh environments. And that is one of the reasons why we teamed up with Vibram to design what is effectively a hiking boot sole for the bottom of the prosthetic foot, because people still walk barefoot in developing countries, often in like outdoor settings. Now, as far as biodegradable, um, these are not, and I'm trying to think, would they be recyclable in any way? Um, possibly um, nylon uh, that we use uh, for the, it's a nylon 6.6 that we use for the keel, is a thermoplastic, and so it can be melted, uh, unlike a thermoset, which, which cannot be remelted. And so there's possibly a, a way to do that, but I think what's probably more likely, instead of taking the time, because we're talking about order tens of dollars of materials in here. I don't know if the, the economics would justify stripping the cosmesis off here, which is a polyurethane foam, because we might be able to recycle that if we ground it up and, and entrained it in the new polyurethane. Um, I'm not sure if the economics would justify doing that, and I'm not sure if the volume of feet that we'd be producing would justify that. And, and to put that in perspective, it's not something you do with your shoes typically right now, and shoes are produced at a much, much higher volume than prosthetic feet are in the world. Okay, I have an, another question. Um, Emma Jolie, would you like to ask your question related to 3D printing? Yeah, so my question was, how do you imagine advances in 3D printing will help prototyping? And would you say that it's particularly helpful for design, or is it about the same since it won't always be on the same material as the product? That's a great question, I, and uh, we we are, um, I guess, subject to advances in 3D printing in a few ways. So one, as more materials are compatible with 3D printing, that gives us more options uh, of, of how we could 3D print or, or from what we could 3D print our feet. Um, printing time is really important. Um, so, you know, to print a foot like this, it's, you know, on the order of many hours because it's a big block of material. Um, the third area is the mechanical behavior of 3D printed parts, not just material behavior uh, that's dictated by the type of plastic, but also how the plastic is bonded with the adjacent plastic when you do the printing. So when you've looked at 3D printed parts before, and I suspect many of you have seen this before, you'll often see striations in the part surface that, that correspond to every layer that was laid down in the print. Depending on how that, those layers are laid down, they can actually create weak points in the foot. And so uh, much of our current work right now on 3D printed feet is trying to characterize those material behavior relationships, both from the raw material and the printed part material, and how that would affect our foot design. So all of that is influencing our design space. And I can't, I think there was a second part of your question. Can you say that again, if there was? Oh no, you answered it. It was just a thing about like the material. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, uh, oh, if there was another point I wanted to make that I forgot too. Um, so there's a lot of uh, excitement now in, in the engineering and design communities about 3D printing. And I think, you know, like, like CNC machining was, you know, 70, 50, 70 years ago, there was maybe a lot of hype about that, that it could like totally transform, you know, the world of production. I don't think, like, I think 3D printing is going to open up many more opportunities that we didn't have before, but there's still limitations to it 
that make like injection molding or, or conventional subtractive machining, like a milling machine, still really valuable depending on the industrial context. And so what the 3D printing industry is, I think, really looking for now is, is context of products that require a high level of customization, low production volumes, um, and maybe geometries that couldn't be achieved necessarily with other production processes. And in those regards, prosthetic limbs are perfect. They are awesome. And you can see the reason I put this slide back up is imagine these feet 3D printed. Like if we had to mold all these, we'd have to make a zillion different molds for every person's body size and type and weight and activity level. But with 3D printing, we can generate these different ar architectures on the order of an hour. That's how long our optimization takes. And then you have a foot exactly designed for you. And then you throw it in a 3D printer, print it in a few hours, bam, you're done. And so I think we're really leveraging in this project the core value of 3D printing, like what is so transformative about its capabilities with a really matched market context. Great. Um, I have an, another question here. Neil, would you like to ask your question? Um, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Uh, sorry. Um, so I see how mechanical engineering can be used uh, to, for product design in these developing and emerging markets. Um, but like most of us are coders, and that's kind of what we do around here. So I was just wondering if that kind of fit into the picture anyway, or if you could provide some insight on that. Absolutely. Um, you know, and there's some some great examples of that in history. So I, I would say a lot of it is around the adoption of cell phones first before landline phones uh, in many poor countries because you didn't need the infrastructure of a landline if you set up a cell network. So the adoption of cell phones was way faster in, um, in, in emerging markets, you know, largely driven by Africa and India. And then the second is there was a leapfrog in uh, personal computing actually that has happened more recently in emerging markets where people are using their phones for computational activities that historically computer companies thought you would buy a PC for. And, and actually Microsoft made this, uh, this mistake where they, they were trying to ramp up like PC designs for developing countries and then had to backtrack and been like, no, we have to base this more off of mobile phone platforms. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's tremendous opportunities what I would recommend you do is always be looking back and, and, and thinking about situations like this is like doing your detective work to try to understand where is there some unmet need and where is there a need that aligns well with coding, you know, with, and it could be in telecom, it could be in some other information processing, um, or, or it could be in uh, integrated systems. Uh, or IoT is going to be massive in, in the coming years. Uh, Internet of Things in, in like so many consumer products. And you could have insights into, you know, if, if there's some way your toaster could talk to you and use lower power so it's amenable to a solar grid system. All of that is, is really, really important. And another example I gave um, that is so important in, in the coming years is AI and machine learning based techniques. So you've already seen like anytime you jump on Amazon, it's recommending you products that you probably like. And it's doing that purely from pattern matching from machine learning because it's watched what other consumers buy and it's matched those patterns with your buying patterns and predicted what you may want to buy. We are using that type of technique for weather right now is that we can take a ton of weather data over many years and then look at the current weather and say, okay, given the time of day, given the time of year, given what the weather is now, what do we think it's gonna be an hour from now? And when you do those predictions throughout the whole year of predicted operation of a system like our desal systems, you can then much more accurately uh, make sure that the system provides enough water and you can also minimize costs so you don't have oversized solar panels or oversized pumps or oversized tanks. So all of those are examples of like how new advances in, in computational abilities are just going to transform, you know, both the physical and computational landscapes. So I think, you know, if you're into coding, you're in a great space. You're going to have a very uh, fertile career, I would say. That's great advice. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Amos. We're going to wrap up the questions there. Um, we have two students that we would like um, to 
unmute now to present you with a, a memento and a thank you for, for spending your afternoon with us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Winter, for your I'll great. Share my screen too. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, great presentation. We always hear about like prosthetic limbs and everything in the lab context, but you know, I've personally me, I've never heard of like actually being applied in the real world, and you guys actually going out and trying to compete in the market. I thought that was really insightful to see the actual application, not just in the lab. And I think Web Bureau, we just wanted to present you with this amazing T-shirt. Love it. Yeah. Thank you I so much. Subscribe. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess, you know, if I can leave you with one thought in your careers, chase good problems and take the time to dig into what makes them good problems. Um, I, I'm always, you know, I'll, I'll use prosthetics as an example. I'm always flabbergasted when we go to prosthetic limb conferences that we are often the only research group focusing on limb design for developing countries. And, and a lot of the cutting edge research is focused maybe on more like, high-end electromechanical devices, which is also great. Those that dramatically enhance performance, but the mass market of consumers of prosthetic limbs are in poor countries. You're talking about tens of millions of people in need of those devices, whereas you know, a, a really good market of like electromechanical high-end limbs would be in the thousands uh, in, in wealthy countries in the US and Europe. And so I think like if you can put yourself in those kind of necessity is the mother of invention situations and be like, oh my God, you know, here's this crazy problem that affects billions of people. It's technical in nature. Nobody so knows how to solve it. And I have the skills to solve it. That is so powerful. And if you want a role model in that, the guy's name is Louis Pasteur. If you guys have ever heard of Pasteur's Quadrant, Google that after this talk. But, you know, he was known for attacking applied problems through really rigorous science. And what came out of that is things like pasteurization and why you can drink milk and it's not gone bad. Things like uh, immunization came out of this as well. So I look to him as, as, a, as a really great role model. And I think in your generation, particularly with the problems that you are going to face in terms of climate change um, and energy and water, um, if you can apply your intellectual muscle to those really compelling problems, you can literally change the world, which is awesome. Catherine, do you want to go? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I cut you off, Catherine. Oh, no, I was just <laughs> waiting for my turn. Um, uh, I'm wearing my t-shirt, because it's like, I thought it was like a school uniform, and so I just wear it every day. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and thank you for presenting. It was really interesting, considering actually, um, I like reading about prosthetics because it's, it's like a fascinating topic for me. I'm a big fan of these sorts of things. Um, and it's kind of bizarre to think that maybe like, I don't know, 20 years ago, that maybe even further back, that this wasn't like a big thing you could think that was going to happen. Like, you know, like managing to make genuinely realistic and movable limbs out of technology. So thank you for presenting. My pleasure. And thanks for the shirt. Thanks for modeling the shirt. Can't wait to get mine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank students, you stay on thing. because we have announcements. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Have a good afternoon. You too. I'm going to jump off. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. And have a great rest of your summer, folks. <laughs>